Sergey Lopez Taurus, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Poland. You are an assistant professor at the Polish Academy of Sciences, specializing in the early stages of primate evolution. In 2015, you and your colleagues published new research on Darwinius, also known as Ida, the ancient primate whose amazingly preserved fossil was discovered in Germany back in 1983. It was one of my previous guests, Andrew Holmes, who has appeared on this channel more than once, who told me about your work. Uh, you and he were grad students together at the uh, University of Toronto, isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so I I saw Andrew's interviews on, on Gigantopithecus and the one on how mm -hmm. monkeys arrived to the Americas and, and the one on fossil apes, so those were great. Um, Andrew and I, yes, we overlapped. Um, during our graduate st studies at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I haven't heard uh, from Andrew in a while, so uh, uh, I'll say hi now and uh, uh, if he is watching this, so yeah. I'm sure he's watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we're going to be diving into the fascinating and often contentious world of Ida, Darwinius Massili, a creature that lived 47 million years ago and that was hailed by the press at the time as the so-called missing link and earliest human ancestor. But before we unravel the story, let's just hear a bit about your background. Sergi, can you take us down the roads that led to you becoming a primatologist in Poland? Yeah, so um, my first interest in primate evolution uh, that I can remember developed during a course in um, human biology at the University of Barcelona, which is where I did my undergrad. Um, mm -hmm. I remember that the prof when like rather quickly over the first stages of primate evolution. And I just wanted to hear more about it. And I, I remember writing something like um, uh, Purgatorius, what's up with that? Um, and at that time, I didn't know that I would seriously uh, fully dedicate myself into the study of, of primate evolution. Um, but then when I finished my undergrad, I started um, master's in primatology. And I think that was a pivotal moment where I realized that I, I wanted to seriously um, I was passionate about this, um, and it was then when I contacted who would be uh, my future PhD supervisor at the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And um, after I graduated my PhD, then <clears throat> I saw a job posting on Facebook, um, and uh, they was announcing a postdoc position in in Warsaw, and I thought it was a, a really good fit. I I applied, I got it. It was also in Europe, so I could also be like close to my family. Um, and um, after that, I actually went back to uh, North America. I did a postdoc in another postdoc in the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And then I came back to Poland uh, now as a, uh, in the position of an adjunct, which roughly equates that of an assistant professorship um, elsewhere. Um, but yeah, there's very little on um, fossil primates from Poland. So one of my dream goals here is to change that in the future. Well, before we hear more about Ida and what exactly she represents, let's go back to the beginning of this discovery. Sergi, what's the story of how Ida was found? In terms of who actually found her, uh, the story is not at all clear. Um, what we know is that it was found by someone in 1983 at the Messel Pit. The Messel Pit is a quarry, a quarry close to the German city of Frankfurt. And um, something that is peculiar about this fossil is that it came out as a slab and a counter slab. So um, under unclear circumstances, the slab and the counter slab parted ways, and the counter slab ended up at the Wyoming Dinosaur Center in Thermopolis in the United States. Um, this American counter slab was also reconstructed, so we, it would appear to be more complete. Um, but this was later revealed um, to be a mix of real bone and um, fabricated composite uh, by German paleontologist Jens Franzen, who got to study uh, the, Ameri the American counter slab. Um, the thing is that while all this was happening, um, the primary slab had stayed in Germany in possession of uh, an anonymous uh, private collector in secret for like two decades. Mm. Um, and around two 2005, uh, a private collector decided, this private collector decided to sell it. Uh, but at the time, German museums were not interested because it was too expensive. And then a year later in 2006, 
this um, dealer managed to seal the deal with um, Norwegian paleontologist uh, Jörn Hörm, who convinced the Natural History Museum of Oslo to purchase the specimen for $1 million. So not cheap, yeah. So what exactly is the Messel Pit and why is it so important? So the Messel Pit is a former quarry near the village of Messel uh, in Germany, um, which is located just southeast of Frankfurt. So this site is important for the outstanding preservation of its fossils. Unfortunately, all of them are pancaked, um, but there are a lot of complete fossils, very com complete fossils. Um, uh, there are many examples of, uh, that include um, entire animals. There are birds, there are insects, fishes, um, snakes, and more of my interest, there are many mammals like primates, bats, rodents. Um, there's also this incredible uh, specimen of a pregnant primitive horse with the baby still preserved. Oh, yeah. um, and obviously there's Darwinius, uh, which is one of the best preserved, it's the best preserved primate fossil mm -hmm. and the most complete. Um, um, it was so well preserved, preserved that you can even see the stomach contents of what Ida actually last ate, wow. uh, which is kind of crazy. Uh, it, is. <laughs> it is crazy. And um, it was uh, just some leaves and fruits. So we actually know that that's what she actually ate the last. Um, so it's not surprising that given how fossiliferous this site has been and the level of preservation of these fossils, Messel was declared a UNESCO World Heritage, Heritage Site in 1995. So um, I actually got to visit um, the Messel Pit in 2014 um, in a field trip organized by the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Um, there's also this like um, very neat museum by the pit as well with lots of these complete specimens on um, display, which that was mm -hmm. that, quite fun to visit. Um, I, I, also, there's this fun memory I have uh, from the Messel Pit when I was there that there's this well at the bottom of the pit where you can pump out water. Um, and even though the water is drinkable, it tastes like rotten eggs because this, they're full of sulfites. Um, I just drank it so I could say that I drank the, the methyl water, but uh, I don't recommend that, no. No. Do we know, Sergi, why, why these animals just kept falling into this? I mean, obviously things were, were different back in the day, but uh, were they drinking water and fell in? or? So there are a lot of hypotheses of how that happened. So that metal pit back in the day would, would have been a lake and there, there would have been a lot of tectonic activity under that lake and it would release toxic gases uh, and so you you actually see a lot of bats and birds so like flying animals that probably would just like fly into get a sip of water or something and then they would get intoxicated in there, weren't there more than anything else yes yes so um uh it's thought that they just like breath and the the toxic gases fell unconscious or something then they they got preserved yeah wow so what was it like in europe back in the eocene 47 million years ago primitive primates are your specialty so what kind of primates were around at that time so okay there are two major group of primates uh living in europe during the middle eocene mm -hmm. um those would be the omomyoids and the adipoids. Omomyoids can be broadly defined as tarsier or galago-like in adaptation, so they would be small, nocturnal, um, highly specialized for leaping, so they would jump around branches. And so um, on the other hand, you would have adipoids, uh, which can be thought um, of as more like um, lemurs, often larger than omomyoids, um, with a mix of nocturnal and diurnal species and a diversity of arboreal locomotor behaviors. So in terms of their relationships, most phylogenetic analysis resolve omomyoids as being more closely related to modern day tarsiers and adipoids more closely related to uh, a modern group of primates called strepsirines. Um, this group includes 
lemurs, lorises, and bush babies or galagos. Um, the Winius has been described as an adipoid, though. Um, there's also a third group of Eocene primates, the Plesidepiforms, um, a group that lacks almost uh, like the typical primate characteristics, like mm -hmm. the presence of a bar of bone around the orbits or having forward facing eyes. Um, they also have these really weird long uh, rodent like incisors. Uh, but by the Middle Eocene, most of the Plesidepiform lineages had gone extinct. Uh, and particularly in Europe. Okay, let's talk about Ida. Now, when this fossil was first brought to light in the early 2000s, the media hailed the find as the missing link and possibly our own earliest ancestor. Now, take us through the media blitz and some of the misconceptions about Ida that resulted. Uh, yeah, so the media response to the publication of Ida was massive. Um, especially for an early primate. Um, the media usually gives a lot of attention to uh, human fossils, but it's kind of rare to hear that for uh, early primates. Um, it was all over the place, not only in news reports, but uh, Google changed the doodle to uh, display Darwinius. Um, I also remember an episode of Futurama mentioning Darwinius as well, where there was this creation... <laughs> uh, there was this creationist orangutan asking if evolution was real, where was the link between Darwinius Masalai and the rest of primates. It, it's great. Fair enough. But where, then, is the missing link between apes and this Darwinius Masalai? Answer me that, Professor. And um, so, like, I actually celebrate that, that primate evolution became so popular for a hot second. Um, but the issue is that the media wants to hear who are the direct ancestors, our, our direct ancestors, and who is the so-called missing link. Um, so Darwinius filled that space when the authors who described it considered Darwinius and adipoids to be more closely related to anthropoids instead of strepsorites. Anthropoids are the group that include monkeys, um, apes, and humans, so us. Um, but this was supported, in my opinion, and I think that is a fairly shared opinion, uh, by a W phylogenetic tree. Um, many other phylogenetic analyses after this publication that were more uh, complete and comprehensive support adipoids, including Darwinius, to be on the lemur side of the tree and not on the monkey, ape, human uh, side of the tree. Right. And when we say anthropoids, they, as, as you say, they're uh, primates similar to, to ourselves, I guess. They got nails and so forth. And when we think of strepsorines, the lemur likes, they, they're the, the ones with the snouts and the wet noses. And that, that's one way of putting it. Yes, yes. The strepsorines are characterized by, yes, by having this wet nose um, like dogs have. Um, and um, they also have this um, specialized set of teeth that um, it's called the tooth comb because it acts as um, um, uh, for grooming the the fur of the oh, yes. uh, of the of the of the animal. Um, on the other side, um, you have anthropoids, which are usually larger. Um, mm. They have larger brains. Um, uh, you have uh, also a great diversity of them. You have the Pan American primates, um, you have the uh, monkeys from um, Afro Eurasia, and you also have the apes, lesser and great apes. All these are usually larger than than their counterparts, the the strepsorines, and they have this closure. Um, uh, they don't have this wet nose; the the nose is dry. Um, uh, but yes, the, they are men, they're usually more terrestrial, but for example, if you go to the Pan American ones, uh, they're very arboreal there. So there's a lot of variation. In 2015, you and your colleagues did your own research on EDA. So after your study, what did you conclude about Darwinius and its place in the primate family tree? So the main goal of that publication was to explore alternative models, alternative developmental models uh, for Darwinius. 
the original publication used a model based on a squirrel monkey, which is an anthropoid. Uh, so we wanted to provide a model in the context of the Winnius being a strepsirine uh, using a, a lemur model. Um, but in our study, we also found that something that defines anthropoids is a late eruption of the wisdom tooth, which we call the M3. Um, the Winnius doesn't have this late eruption of this tooth, so this adds to a long list of traits that doesn't make Darwinius look anthropoidy. Um, developmentally, Darwinius basically looks like a primitive primate. So um, our paper didn't have the goal of finding what Darwinius was in terms of where it fits in the in the tree of primates, um, but it found this oddity in the um, in the de uh, development dental development. Um, so our study didn't say, oh, it's definitely a uh, um, We cannot say that with what we presented in our, in our paper, but uh, we definitely found something that is at odds with um, the Winnie's being an anthropoid, which has been suggested previously. And uh, you, call, you said that she's actually an offshoot. What did you mean by that? Modern strepsirines all together are what we call the crown strepsirines. So a crown group is that evolutionary clade that uh, the ancestor is the ancestor to all the modern um, members of that clade. So everything that does not develop from that ancestor but it's more closely related to, to this group than to anything else is what we're going to end up calling a stem group. Mm -hmm. So um, the Winnius would be, and adipoids would be, according to most of these um, uh, most of these studies, phylogenetic studies, uh, in the stem of strepsirines, being this offshoot that is not part of the crown. It's not part of the group that derives from the ancestor to all modern strepsirines. It's previous to that. You also did some work on the age of Eda. So uh, what did your research turn up? Yeah, that's right. Um, so our model gave um, Eda a slightly older age of death. Um, the monkey model that the original paper used um, gave Eda an age of death of around nine months. Mm -hmm. um, and our lemur model gave Ida an age of death of around a year. So our model also predicts that Ida would have been closer to her full adult body mass, um, making uh, Darwinius as a species uh, somewhat smaller than it had been predicted overall. So we have to remember that Ida is the only representative of the species and no adults are known for um, for the species of Darwinius Masilei. So any information about how the projected adult Ida would have been is useful to understand what the, um, that species would have looked like um, if it had grown up to adulthood, right? So can you definitively now say that Ida was not the so-called missing link and not our ancestor at all? Um, well, never say never to uh, this type of questions. Uh, some relationships um, that were thought to be true uh, a couple of decades ago later turn out to not be the case. Um, but I think that after the publication of Darwinius, many studies have made more convincing cases to Darwinius and adipoids are in fact more closely related to uh, lemurs than they are to monkeys, apes, and humans. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, Darwinius not being anywhere close to our ancestral primate doesn't really make um, for a good Google logo or anything really flashy, right? Um, I think that part of the media hype is due to the weight that is put to finding the missing link. Um, evolution is 
a complex nonlinear mess. Uh, finding a fossil that is directly ancestral to us is rare um, because at the end of the day, when you excavate fossils, you find what you find. Uh, rarely you find what you want to find. Um, I think we should be able to appreciate Darwinius as a lemur-like primate because that in itself is already interesting. Um, and lemur evolution is fascinating, um, although I might be a little biased there. Um, but it's still related to us anyway, really. No, exactly. Like if you ask, is Darwinius related to us? The answer is yes, to some extent, yes, very distantly. Um, it's less related to us than apes and monkeys are, but more related to us than our uh, dogs, koalas, birds, or palm trees. Uh, at the end of the day, all living organisms are related, but some will be more so than others. So, yeah. So I'm sure you still give credit to those who still think that she's an anthropoid. No, of course. Uh, I think it's healthy in for science, any science, to have these sort of discussions. Um, the idea that adipoids were anthropoids is not no. It comes from um, the early um, 20th century, um, but it has been revived with this Darwinius now, well now, a decade ago now. Um, but uh, I think it's healthy to listen to people, see what they have to say, and then if you have an idea, test it, and if it works, great. If, if it doesn't, or if it gets debunked, great as well. That's, I, f I feel like this is a collective effort, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the facts at the end of the day, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's been great to hear some of the up-to-date information on this important fossil. So much of what is out there online is really quite old. And uh, thanks to you and your team, new light has been shed on this extremely significant find. Uh, so what are you working on at the moment, Sergi? Anything uh, you can tell us about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've actually been venturing outside the realm of fossil uh, primates recently. Um, in the last paper that I published with my co-authors, um, we described the first virtual endocast. So that would be like um, a virtual reconstruction of a brain of a fossil bunny. Well, the technical term should be a fossil lagomorph, but Bunny yeah. has a better better ring to it. Uh, this was exciting because um, very little is known about the brain evolution in lagomorphs. Um, now I'm more interested in exploring the fossil groups that are closely related to primates, like lagomorphs, rodents, tree shrews, flying lemurs, all those um, groups. I'm currently working on a fossil group called Anagallids. Um, it's a lineage that went entirely extinct by the end of the Eocene and lived in Asia. Um, and they're definitely weird and very little has been published on them. So um, I want to say more, but I probably shouldn't. So uh, stay tuned oh. for Anagallid uh, papers. Yeah. I will leave links to your work and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you so very much, Sergi, for coming on to Evolution Soup. Yeah, thank you for having me.